everybody, we're back for another episode of The Jump Show. It's episode four in our anti-post series. It's been great fun so far, and I'm sure we'll continue to be so. Thank you so much for all of those who've liked and subscribed to our videos and our channel over the course of the last few months or so. If you haven't, please do. We would love to have your subscriptions. Not too far away from the 1500 target. It'd be great to hit that. By the Cheltenham Festival and a like goal of 150 I'm going to put this week would be great to hit too. So uh, thanks in advance for all your help. Once again, alongside both Jake Price and Dan Overall, very exciting time of year, Jake. I imagine you've got your breakfast cutlery ready because this next couple of weeks is going to be your bread and butter. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant link. Um, yeah, trial day this weekend, DRF the weekend after. We've got three massive pods coming up. We've got, you know, the build up to, to the trials day. We've got the trials day review next week. Then obviously the DRF review the week after. Like these are some of the biggest trials for Cheltenham. And surely we're going to find so many Cheltenham winners across these two weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this Saturday's card at Cheltenham is an absolute belter as well. There should be uh, plenty of informative information on show. Uh, Dan, you had a cold on the show last week. And I'm sorry to say that it's still there. Yeah, my immune system is made of Swiss cheese. And again, this happens <laughs> before every Cheltenham meeting. Like, generally, my body shuts down when it knows the Cheltenham meeting is coming out. It's absolutely outrageous. <laughs> oh, God knows what it's going to do when it's we're coming up to the DRF. I think <laughs> I'll have to load me onto the plane horizontal just to get me across uh, the water. I, I don't know. I, it just knows. And uh, understandably so. Like, I, I will feel the effects. But it's trying to save me from myself. And will I listen? Of course I won't. But you're, you're getting all the bad antibodies out of your system, aren't you, in, in time for all the bad stuff that's going to go into your system? Yeah, so my body's already in like a lower depressed state, and what I'm going to do is <laughs> add more on top. Exactly. I'm the peak of yeah. health. Before we do our uh, anti-post tip number four, we're going to talk about a few other things first and kick off, as we usually do on The Jump Show, with a review from last weekend. There hasn't been much to review over this because of the last few weeks because of the weather, but luckily today we do have plenty to talk about because Sunday's action was uh, very informative indeed at both Dulles and at Lingfield too. So we're going to kick off by talking about Harmonia Maker, who is now 16-1 to for the Mayor's Chase after winning and beating her old rivals, Jake. Yeah, I think she's a she's an interesting mayor, isn't she? She's, she's, she's almost very good when she's good and then very bad when she's bad. I think we've kind of found out now that two and a half miles is exactly her trip. Um, you know, she tried two six the last day and Hulturia beat her. And Hulturia, I think she's definitely more of a staying type, you know, more of a three miler probably in time. Um, and I perhaps, you know, don't see this as a, a real big trial towards the mayor's chase. Obviously, these are novices we're talking about and novices going into open company if they were to run in the mayor's chase because it's an open company race. Um, and they would also be penalized as well, what harm one you make it would because she's just won a grade two. But I think these are mares that I'm probably not thinking about in terms of the mares chase this year, but perhaps next year they might develop into it. Um, Harmonia Maker's only a seven-year-old. You know, she's still got time to develop and to to learn her trade of offences. So I think two and a half is her trip, but perhaps she stays the mares novice company for now and, and builds herself up a bit more. Yeah, what I do think she has in her favour is she's a pretty slick jumper when she gets going. So uh, that's definitely going to stand her in good stead. Uh, Dad Linkfield, I thought it was a really good card on Sunday, actually. Uh, some very good horses on show. Obviously, the Lightning Novices chase was ruined a little bit as a spectacle uh, at the first fence when Matata, as is his wont, went absolutely mad. Uh, but aside from that, we saw a, a good victory from JPR1, didn't we? It was chaos at that first fence. I don't think any, any horse came out unscathed from that one, to be honest. It was really up in the air. Obviously, Matata jumping markedly left caused it all, and a few were inconvenienced. Master Chewy obviously probably got the worst of it, other than Jello, obviously, who came down. I think JPR1 did a lot right, really. I mean, he travelled well on the outside, jumped really well. For once, he didn't make a crucial last fence or a second last fence error, which we'd seen in the last two starts. So he kind of deserved this victory, really. It had been coming. Whether it's really going to point out an Arkle winner, I'd be very much doubtful. I think he's the type who can definitely place in an Arkle. We're going to probably get a relatively small field, you would imagine. Has all the attributes to run a decent race there. Could he challenge a Marine National? Probably not. But again, he'll be odds on for an old Holden Gold Cup uh, come November next year. Uh, and that'll probably be that for him. But I don't think any of these are real bona fide grade one horses. In other, If they were campaigned differently, you'd be probably thinking more grand annual types, but they're all rated in the high 140s to around 150. They're probably not going to change that much. They probably aren't well handicapped enough to win a grand annual. So what the impact on the festival will be of this race, uh, I'm not really too sure. 
Yeah, it might not have a huge impact. I mean, if I was Joe Tizard, I think I'd be quite keen myself on running JPR1 from the front in the Arkle because he can use his slick jumping, which he does in the main have. But he's only made a couple of blemishes in, in his few starts so far. Generally, he jumps really well. And I think if he goes out in front, it'll make it easier for him. And obviously, Marine National get a nice toe into it. And he won't win, but he might pick up a place. I think if I was Tizard, I'd be keener on doing that. But, um, you know, maybe it's good that I'm not Joe Tizard, to be fair. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Cool. Right. On to the, uh, I suppose, main classy horse of the day on Sunday, apart from Long Presse. And that's Alaho, who won the Horse and Jockey Hotel Chase Grade 2 over two and a half miles. Now, I don't want to be too rude about the race, but uh, Jake, in my opinion, it was a complete farce. I uh, appreciate it. was never really put in it. And then Statler, who's not run a race for years, has just kind of got in there on the outside. But Alaho didn't really have to do much. So I don't think we learned a huge amount. But he still heads the market for the Rhino. Yeah, I think what we what we've seen with Allo is this season he's just lost his sense of invincibility that he's you know kind of earned for himself from all these massive performances that he's put up in the past. Um, so I can see why a lot of people are crabbing him, wanting to take him on in the Brian Air, um, especially at short prices. And I, you know, I certainly wouldn't be worried myself of taking him on anymore like I used to would have been. Um, you know, it was normally a race where you go, oh, the Brian Air, Allo's in there, he wins that, move on. It's obviously not that anymore. In terms of the race on Sunday, I think it is a massive shame that Envoy Allen was a non-runner because um, he, he ended up being a non-runner on the morning from coughing. Um, and I think he just would have set a perfect benchmark to see how good Alaho actually still is. Um, I think he would have you know, been that perfect yardstick. It's a shame, obviously, he didn't get to run. As you said, the race then afterwards wasn't that great. He did what he had to do. He won in, you know, visually, he won in good style, but the substance of that obviously is up down to question. I think that, you know, in the context of the Ryanair, it's not exactly a rented renewal either, though. You know, if it turns up soft, we're going to lose Banbridge, who I think is obviously a massive player myself. But if we don't have Banbridge, then Alaho might not actually have to run to too much of a higher level to even win the Ryanair anyway. Um, you know, he's probably going to get taken on for the lead, but he's surely going to run his race either way. And that might well be good enough. Um, you know, he's probably not the banker that he used to be, but he was obviously still a good horse. And it would just be interesting to see how he runs. But I think he'll just run his race and... As I said, that might be good enough if we don't get someone like a Banbridge turn up. Yeah, it could turn into a, a, one of the weaker races of the festival, Dan, in terms of grade ones, couldn't it? In, in terms of competition, really, because you might not have that many runners and those that we do have may not be, might not be vintage Ryanair stuff. Uh, no, well, it's, yeah, it's hard to really say because to a certain extent, Alaho used to scare a few off and he's just not going to anymore. But as you say, the main danger to him would be Banbridge and obviously he's very ground dependent. So there's some question marks. Let's be, let's be realistic. Alaho's really only had one race this season. The other two have been processions where nothing was allowed to get near him. That's the the absolute reality of it. Again, appreciate it. it was, all of his best form is, comes when Ridden Handley was restrained because can't touch Alaho. So that was that out the window. And then Statler, who hasn't run a promising race in God knows how long and is once 15 miles, was the only one to look like he could vaguely threaten because French Dynamite had blood in his trachea when the race finished. So he he bombed out as can be expected when that's the case. We we learned nothing again fr from this run of Alaho. All The only run we learned anything was the King George. It's the only race he's had this season where he should have finished fourth if Shishkin had stood up. And I don't really see any excuse for him in that race, given his Punchestown Gold Cup heroics of what we've been. I don't think it's a stamina issue. I think he's just not the horse he was. He could run into a mark in the mid-160s, and that could well be good enough to win a Ryanair uh, at this kind of level. It's probably good enough to be there or thereabouts in last year's Ryanair with the way that panned out. But it wouldn't be a horse I'm interested in backing at all, really. It's a shame, really, that he's, he's kind of come to this, where he's running in such farcical races for the most part. Like It's what could have been, really, when there was always that chance of him running in like likes of the King George a couple of seasons earlier after his Punchestown Gold Cup heroics and all of that. What he, he could have been reveled as one of the all-time greats if they took in those races sooner. Obviously, the the injury issue or what he had, they couldn't have predicted, of course. But it's it's almost a bit sad watching these races, really, because they're just not events. But yeah, I, I, not not an interesting horse for me coming into Cheltenham. But I'll look to take away. Banbridge runs and great. If not, I might just leave the race alone or have something at a massive price, really. Uh, yeah, actually, for me too, I think it would probably be the least interesting grade one of the festival, uh, looking at it from a way off. Uh, let's talk about high-class hero Jake. Hadn't seen him for a while. Came back and, and won in pretty nasty ground on Sunday. Uh, he's going to face very different conditions, likely to face very different conditions in the Albert Bartlett itself. What did you make of his performance? 
yeah, he's an interesting horse, isn't he? You're having had the summer campaign, had the break, and now coming back to, to get started and get going again. Um, I, I think going into this race, I didn't really think it was a race where we're going to learn too much about High Class Hero in terms of his Albert Bartlett chances. Obviously, it'd be good to see him back, good to see him over a bit of an extended trip, but I thought it was a pretty poor race, you know, going into it. So I, I wasn't too worried about, you know, whatever whatever happened, to be honest, unless he absolutely bolted up and smashed them, which he obviously didn't do with it being as a well-touted, you know, sprint up the straight. Um, I, I think, you know, you'd be more than happy with him. Uh, he, he did what he had to do, but he is going to be, you know, he's he's now favourite for the Bartlett. And, I, I, you know, he wouldn't be a horse that takes my interest at that type of price, especially at this stage. Um, I think there's plenty of other horses in the race that are going to be popping up, you know, between now and then you've got the Dublin Racing Festival race. And yeah, he's, he's just not one for me. Um, I think he'll he'll run his race and probably have a good chance, but he, he's going to be short. And, you know, he hasn't proven it in the book, in the form book yet that he can definitely win a grade one like that. He's going to be very, a very divisive horse when it comes to the preview night circuit because the people just can't really put a, a really guess where he is at. I say yeah. all of his races have been fairly slowly run. The only race he had double figure field was where he made all in his maiden hurdle. So while he has experience, which people generally look for in Albert Bartlett, he doesn't really have experience of what the conditions will be like. So that'll that'll be a debate that goes back and forth on all the preview circuits. Yeah, funnily enough, I think he might benefit from a, a stronger pace, bigger field, and he'll definitely benefit from better ground. I think I think he he could be a, a live player, to be fair. Um, but you know, he's got it to prove, of course, with plenty of those uh, variables. Dan, I know you're going to be happy to talk about the uh, the final horse of the week. This is the performance of the week, actually, as voted by you at home. 52% went with Long Presse, and uh, you can understand why. How did you rate the performance, Dan? Well, um, if you have got into this conversation after about four fences, I would, wouldn't really have believed you, because it did not look good from an early stage. Obviously, made a, a bad error at the first, then skied the second, Charlie Deutsch had about three or four glances down to check if am I actually sat on the horse I think I'm sat on here <laughs> early doors. I was, like, I was like, well, it was fun while it lasted. Like it, He had a good run, but as the contest warmed up, his jumping improved. And to be fair, I don't think he was really happy until he actually turned the bend for home and then all of a sudden he loomed up alongside Protectorat, who I think has run up to a, a very good level by Protectorat standard. He had the run of the race, jumped well, out in front, enthusiastic. They pulled well clear of the rest. But suddenly Long Press loomed up on long side, going much the best, and it was basically over. I don't think he was really pushed out to do all that much. I think Charlie Deutsch, a very sympathetic rider, wasn't going to give him an overly hard race. I think he's probably won a bit more cosily than the winning margin would suggest. And, and it's just great to see him back. Obviously, he's a, a personal favourite of mine. Also, I've already back for the Gold Cup a, a while ago, uh, early last year or late last year, once everyone was kind of falling by the wayside before uh, Pinder Champs decided to route the field by 23 <laughs> lengths in the Savills, it has to be said. But there you go. Look, he's the live British contender, in my opinion. It's just a case of his campaigning now. They're saying they're going to go to Ascot. I think they're only going to go to Ascot if the ground's on the soft side. Um, uh, there are questions there. Obviously, it's two mile five going right-handed. He jumps out to the left. It, it's going to be is interesting, but I think there's pros and cons to going straight to the Gold Cup or taking Ascot along the way. Like If you go straight to the Gold Cup, you're thinking second star after a long absence, and that never really is ideal. Then again, he could also have quite a hard race at Ascot, and that doesn't mean he's properly right for the Gold Cup, a race they've probably been trying to get him at for two years, really, in A1 condition. This will be his only realistic chance at it. So pros and cons, I, I don't know really which way I'd go, but I think it's really hard to say, but great to see him back. Let's be real, if Gallopin de Champ runs up to the level he did in last year's Gold Cup or in the Savills, Long Press, I don't think he's capable of that level. But if he, he runs up to his best, he's, I think, very well able to compete with the sort of B level of Gallopin de Champ, and that could well be good enough. Yeah, it could easily be good enough. Uh, I don't know about you, but Venetia Williams in the past has been uh, no stranger to to running horses off layoffs. I know mean, it wouldn't be as big a layoff if uh, Long Press went straight to the Gold Cup now, but um, she's definitely done that kind of thing in in the past. It's quite interesting, really, that she's thinking about Ascot. Yeah, well, I guess to a certain extent, obviously he's had his issues and they're making up for lost time. And maybe they're cautious of the fact that the second time after a layoff isn't exactly ideal either. And it's a race that could well suit him if the ground is soft. It's a lot of variables there and doesn't tend to be an overly strong race a lot of the time. And they've got a horse, generally of the lifetime, who's up to 170 level, running the best races, don't you, while you can. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right, let's move on to uh, some updates, actually, from the last week or so. We've heard, as regards the Cheltenham Festival, uh, the Lawless and Nace Hurdle, 
Uh, Firefox and Croke Park, both reported to be lame. So we thought reading Tommy Rong's victory was a bit of a surprise. Well, there are a couple of excuses in behind. So there you go. Firefox going straight to the Supreme and Croke Park straight to the Albert Bartlett's. El Fabiolo runs at the Dublin Racing Festival rather than this Saturday's Clarence House Chase, in which John Bon is currently around about a 3-1 to one on shot to win that. A gentleman's game unlikely to run in the Irish Gold Cup, and Crambo is going to go straight to the Stayers Hurdle, and he'll go there too with a pretty live chance as well. Right, let's move on to what's happening this weekend, and it's Trials Day at Cheltenham, uh, an extra long card, an extended card due to the rearrange Clarence House Chase and I know that Dan you and Jake are both going I imagine you're very excited and uh, give us a, a horse or two uh, to look forward to on the day as regards the Cheltenham Festival yeah it's, it's some interesting ones out and Doncaster as well is a, a decent card as well so I think there'll be a few informative races around one I'm interested with you to the grand annual be Fernando Civila who is in the Clarence House is also at Doncaster I think he's kind of the old school Grand annual type winner. Right? He's a two mile specialist who's dropped to a very good mark of 148. In an ideal world, I actually don't want him to run until the grand annual, but they're seemingly going to go somewhere. Just keep an eye on him because I think he's getting very well handicapped. And then you've got the Mullins Mares and wherever they're going to end up Lossy Mouth, Gala Marso, and Ashro Diamond. Seems like Lossy Mouth will go to the international based on the markets, despite the now infamous Impere Pass tweet by Munir and Suede, which uh, did a lot of people up, which was mildly amusing after I saw it a bit late and looking in hindsight. Sorry if you got burnt by that, but I found it quite funny. <laughs> and then you've got Ashro Diamond <laughs> seemed to go into Doncaster and maybe Gala Marceau now runs at W Race Festival. I don't know. It's a good question, but it'd be good to see them back considering they're the two of the main market leaders for the Mayor's Hurdle and we haven't actually seen them since, well, last season. So good to see where they're both at. They're not going to be A1 for their reappearances. The aim is all about March, but yeah, just a, a bit of an idea of where those lot are at. Good stuff. Yeah, totally agree with all that you just said. Uh, and Jake, for you, I think you're going to look at the what could be a real cracker of a triumph trial, actually. It's a great race in prospect. Yeah, well, I mean, just firstly, like Dan, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing these Mullins mares back out. It'll be very interesting to see how they're split up. Um, but yeah, the triumph trial on Saturday looks like it's going to be a very good race. Third at Road Connections kind of toyed with going to the international. It looks on Jockey Book and right now that Harry Cobden's on in the Triumph um, and he's got a ride in the International. So I'd imagine he'll be going for the Triumph trial. And if so, I'm actually really looking forward to it because I just want to see you know, him have a much sterner test and he's going to get that if, if everything turns up here. Uh, so Gino looks like he's set to run for Nicky Henderson. Obviously, it would be great to see him up in grade. Um, the, the infamous Milantino is coming back for more against Burdett Road. And then Interloto might also turn up as well for Joseph O'Brien. Um, he was a winner at Leopardstown over Christmas. And that's also not forgetting Salva as well, you know, the grade two finale juvenile hurdle winner as well. So there would be plenty more um, to take on Burdett Road because if you go back and look at that November race, it, it really wasn't that great, was it? Um, and I think that something that's going to be even more fascinating than him winning it is, you know, does he race in the same style as he did there? Because I just don't see, if he does race in the exact same as he does in November, I don't think you're going to get away with it against the like of a Sergino or potentially even an interloto, depending on, you know, just how good that maiden form is. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing Bird at Road in a sterner chest and hopefully it will prove me right that I'm right to take him on. Or if not, it will make us all look very foolish and there'll be a very short price favourite for the Triumph. Can't wait to see him either. I absolutely cannot wait. The excitement that was emanating from James Owen's yard when I went there the other day was quite something <laughs> to behold. They are all so mouthwatering. They're licking their lips we uh, all know you've given the horse a pat. Now he's going to win. Yeah. <laughs> Fed him a carrot. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what, though? Do you know what, though? Horses I've patted so far this season have done quite well. That's all right, Gino, winning the Hennessy. Yeah. You know, say more. I know it's only mm -hmm. one example, but... Uh, that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> evidence, right, evidence and sample sizes aren't your speciality, are they, Bully? <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you actually bag on with that, actually. Yeah, it's a really good, uh, really good, really good point. Um, yeah, I'm just going to mention a, a couple of running on Saturday as well at Cheltenham. Uh, in the uh, handicap chase, two mile five handicap chase, a uh, hitman's running uh, for Paul Nichols for mark 156. Uh, he's dropped uh, five or six pounds this season because he's not been in, in well for, for quite a long time, really. Uh, he'd be a horse though that if not running like massively well this time, but also not disappointing hugely. If he if he runs a decent race on Saturday, I can see the handicap maybe dropping another pound uh, potentially, and uh, he might be one for the plate possibly. 
uh, given that he's got very good back goal, decent back class, particularly in a race of that nature. And often a classy horse wins the plate. Uh, so if they did decide to go down that route, uh, I can see Hitman uh, running a big race off what is a, a fairly sliding handicap market. It's slow sliding handicap market, but it's sliding nonetheless. And the other one I wanted to mention, uh, that comes in the 115, by the way. Uh, the other one I wanted to mention in the 410, it's the Novices Hurdle to close the card. The SSS Super Alloys Novices Hurdle, grade two usually known as the classic over the extended two and a half. And uh, among others, Look Away in Django Bay. But the horse that I think most people are excited about seeing, myself included, is Gidley Park, who's unbeaten so far, three from three. Impressed hugely on his both starts over hurdles at Exeter, then Newbury last time, barely coming out of a canter. This would be a much sterner test of his credentials. Uh, but if he goes and, and wins well, like he has done so far, I think he probably will do. Um, he could be a live player for the British in the Ballymore. And depending on the manner of his victory, we could see him up near favouritism if he, if he really bolts in. So I'd keep an eye out for him in that 4-10, the last race on the card at Cheltenham. Okay, uh, on to anti-post bet time, the moment we've all been waiting for. And this week, Dan, we'll start with you, with your selection number four. Yeah, and the, the curse of the odds checker blue has, has struck me yet again. Every time like, it seems to happen, I think this is now three weeks in a row, one I wanted to put up was a price and then gets cut on the day we're recording. So I don't know if my computer's been bugged and they can see my notes, <laughs> but it's getting a bit too coincidental now. But I'm going to go with it because I, I do still like the horse and I think there's reasons to expect he will shorten. It comes in the bumper and it's you ought to know for Willie Mullins. Willie's in the bumper. Let's leave it at that. But <laughs> it's a bit of a muddling market, really. I don't think we've really had an absolute standout. Obviously, Jalan Dudari is probably the one who's achieved the most at this stage. He's going straight to Cheltenham by the sounds of it. He's entered the Dublin Racing Festival, probably won't run. Then the much-touted Romeo Coolio, who, from what we've seen on his sole run, needs to improve a lot, but he seemingly fought a lot of. Then you've got the likes of Maureen up there, obviously also Willie Mullins, but could go anywhere and could well go to Aintree instead. So... Some questions to answer in that regard. And I think there's every chance that you ought to know could well end up being Willie's number one for the bumper. Obviously, the doubling race festival will decide that. And I think you can also argue that he's got standout bumper form already. And I think it's maybe just being a bit overlooked because it was so long ago. So he made his debut in May at Kilbegan, bolting up, beating a certain Croke Park by 11 lengths, who's turned out to be pretty useful. Visually very impressive, looked a strongly run race, proper test. And obviously, Croke Park has obviously won a grade three since. And the third was actually also worked out to be pretty decent as well. Then went to Galway in August, another sharp test on decent enough ground under a penalty, where he beat a horse called Toto 2, giving him a stone. That horse won his next two starts and then was back like he couldn't be beat at Cheltenham before seemingly a miss because we haven't seen him since. Rate, recording racing post ratings of 125 and 123 in both of those. like Those are very high ratings. And I think A Dream to Share showed that you shouldn't just dismiss summer form in bumpers that early because it can work out to be pretty decent. And I think there's every reason to suspect, based on what we've seen, this horse is far more than the summer horse. I say They were both sharp tracks that he ran at, and he looks to me a real galloping type who will benefit from a much sterner test and a strong pace. And I think the plan all along was to give him a break after those two runs. They mentioned he could go hurdling. Now, I don't know. I'm not privy to inside information at Willie Mullins like so few people seem to be. But I'm not sure... It was maybe if there's been a setback or whether it's just the case that because Willie doesn't have a standout bumper horse really this season or hasn't seemed to, it or especially from an early stage, whether they kept him back with a view to running in these championship level bumpers because of the form he's already shown. I don't know, but there was always the plan to leave him out and not run on deep winter ground. So I'm not too worried about that. Obviously, he's entered the Dublin Racing Festival. It'll be an interesting race because the likes of a dream to share in there, obviously, a weird case of a champion bumper winner running in another bumper. Doesn't happen, if ever, I can remember on the season after. But again, imagine a scenario where you ought to know actually comes out and beats a dream to share and some of these others. He's going to be the favourite. Like That form will probably be the strongest form on offer going into the champion bumper come March. And I think there's every reason to expect that you ought to know would be one of Willie's more fancied runners in that. And I can see a perfectly viable scenario where he's the number one for the yard come the day. And in that case, he's not going to be the 14 to one chance he currently is was 20 to 1 earlier, I might point out. But I think 14 <laughs> to 1 is reasonable enough. So again, it's one of those where I'm prepared to take a chance at that price because I can see a world very much so, even if he's like a close-up second, where he's cut a fair bit shorter come March. Fascinating stuff as usual, Dan. Nice to have a runner in the bumper. Jake, I know you've got something to say about that as well. 
Yeah, I think it's a great bet because if he does finish second to A Dream to Share, then it's still the best ball in the race because A Dream to Share can't run in, in the bumper anyway. So you're kind of playing betting without, which is, you know, definitely works in your favour for an anti-post bet. But the fact that A Dream to Share can still run in this bloody bumper is just a joke, <laughs> isn't it? Like, he's already won a grade one bumper. Why are we letting him run in another one? It's a mess. Somewhere, yeah, if you listen real closely, you can hear Kevin Blake tearing his hair out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're preaching to the choir there, Jake, son, I've got to say. Um, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nip in before you this week then, Jake, with my interpose selection number four. I'm going to go with Monty Starr in the brand advisory. He's currently a 16 to 1 shot to win that contest. Uh, those of you with um, fairly deep filofaxes and long memories might remember uh, his point to point on the 5th of December 2021, Monty Starr, when he finished six length second to none other than stay away, Faye. Yes, that's right. However, I think the two years we've had in between, or three years now, I should say, mean that the tables can be turned come Cheltenham in March. Uh, most of you know as well, Monty Starr was a decent enough hurdler last year. He was pretty lightly campaigned, only had three starts over those small obstacles, uh, won the Clonmel Grade 3 and decent style over Hidden Valley Lake. That's the Mercedes-Benz. Probably wasn't the strongest race in the world, but... He did show plenty of stamina, which is rather becoming his forte, I feel. And I think it all happened a little bit too fast. He wasn't quite good enough over hurdles, really, in the Albert Bartlett, when in the end he was pulled up. <clears throat> He's a better horse than that, uh, but he didn't really produce on the day. Uh, since going chasing, uh, he, he's, he's run twice now. Uh, he finished third behind Corbett's Cross in what looked a pretty decent race at the time. And I think it's probably an OK contest, looking back on it now. Uh, Corbett's Cross, though, for my money, isn't completely in love with jumping fences. I think he's probably happier over hurdles for all they're going to keep him over the, the larger ones for now. And he actually finished behind three card brag that day in third place and was, you know, beaten fair and square, but quite clearly needed the run behind the Gordon Elliott run that day. There's no doubt about that because we saw him again <clears throat> next time. That was at Punchestown on New Year's Eve, where he beat three card brag with head and chest. Uh, very easily indeed, and jumped really well. I thought that was his biggest asset. He was supremely slick in the fencing department, which stood him in very good stead. Three-card Bragg didn't jump particularly badly, but uh, Monty Starr was kind of getting a length or two, I would say, at, at least three or four of the fences in that race, and that definitely helped him on to a, to a nice win. Now, three-card Bragg probably isn't going to run in that race. He might well go to the four-miler or the three-mile-sixer at, uh, at Cheltenham, uh, but uh, Monty Starr is probably going to go for the round advisory. I don't mind so much the fact that he's got an hasn't got an entry in the Labrox Novice Chase at the DRF. Neither has he got one at Navan on Sunday. <clears throat> it would be no surprise at all if Henry de Bromme decided to go straight there. When Minella Indo finished a very close second to Champ in the RSA back of 2020, 2020 when he was only beaten a length, I would say that uh, Motti Star looks a proper hardy doer type. It was three miles in heavy ground last time at Punchdown that he won over, and uh, he looked like he would relish further in time if there's any rain come Cheltenham that'll suit him too so wouldn't put you off him at all in that regard likewise though on the sounder service I think he'd be just fine too uh, his point both his point to point seconds are on good ground so I think he'd be okay on, on anything really but if it does come up heavy that would certainly give him an advantage whereas to many it probably wouldn't do uh, looking through the, the brown advisory market uh, Grange Clare West currently favourite after that really good win last time uh, he's currently favourite for the DRF uh, the Labrick's Novice Chase uh, I I mean, for the sake of Monty Starr, I hope he runs there. I don't think he probably will do uh, because the team have also got Factor File in there. And Grange Clare West had a pretty hard race over Christmas. For all that, he was very impressive. I think if they ran him again at Dublin, that would be one hard race too many. I'd quite like to see it because it would give Monty Starr, who's had fewer starts and less time to, I suppose, grow tired, really, during the course of the season, a bigger chance. Uh, Factor File is unexposed. He's going well. And at the moment, it looks a fairly strong market. But likewise, I can see him disappointing a little bit at the DRF. It's quite it looks like it might be quite a strong race, that Labrick's novice chase. Stay away Faye is taking on his elders probably on Saturday in the Cotswold chase. That looks a really strong race. And I think taking on his elders is going to be uh, a much stiffer test for him. And it wouldn't be at all surprised if he got beaten. That said, I don't think that would be a hindrance to his uh, brown advisory chances as a chaser. Uh, because, of course, he is taking on those older and, and better, more esteemed protagonists uh, but at the same time it might just see him drift out a bit in the market gray dawning you're a big fan of dan i know that i wouldn't be quite as big a um a kind of fan of this horse because 
I did think the race really fell into his lap last time out at Warwick. And I do think he is beatable on, on some of the starts we've seen over fences and over hurdles too. Uh, a Corbett's cross, I think, is very beatable. I don't think he really wants fences at all. Then we come to Monty Starr in the market. He's a 16-1 to 1 shot in a place, uh, generally kind of 14s. Uh, but I can see him running really well each way uh, in that contest and uh, potentially shortening if others before then disappoint. The one race that Monty Starr could go for beforehand, because I don't think he's going to come over across the water for the Reynolds down, even though I kind of hope he did. Uh, it's a bit close to Cheltenham. And why would Henry de Bromo send him there when there are other opportunities over in Ireland, including the 10 up novice chase? Uh, and I think that would be his most likely port of call if he does go somewhere before Cheltenham. I don't think he needs to, as I said, but it would be quite nice just to have that little bit more chasing experience in him. That race as well tends not to be the strongest. And uh, actually, Henry de Brom had won it back in 2019 with Chris's Dream. So um, a similar sort of type is Monty Star, actually. So if they, if they do go somewhere, I think it'll be the 10 up. But if not, I'd be happy enough going straight to Cheltenham. So fingers crossed from a big run for Monty Star, a seven-year-old, I think, very much on the up. So that's my anti-post bet number four. And that leaves you, Jake, with yours. Yeah, you kind of gave me flashbacks of when Champ beat him another end there. So thanks for that. Um... <laughs> Sorry, <mate. laughs> That's all good. I'm finally over it now. Um, yeah, so I've been sitting on this selection for a couple of weeks now, waiting for the right time. As, as we say, you know, timing is is kind of crucial when, you, when you're looking at anti-post betting. And I think this is this is the week to put up my Boodle selection. I'm going to try to find the next Jazzy Matty. And that oh, is going Jesus. to be... <laughs> Hopefully he's actually better than Jazzy Matty, which I think he is. He's definitely shown a high level of form so far. Um, and the horse in question is trained by Joseph O'Brien, but he's probably not the one that you're expecting me to say here, as I actually really like Cossack Chak. Um, now, as I said, he's a horse that hasn't been on many people's radars. I haven't seen him spoken about a lot, but he's a juvenile who started his career on a flat in June, where he had a spin over at the car over one mile two. And then he wasted no time getting over hurdles, won a three-year-old maiden at Killarney the following month. Um, and, you know, he really was just learning the job as he went. It's only his second race course appearance. And he recorded an easy falling success in the end. As I said, got better as the race went on. So I think at that point they've decided, right, he's actually a good horse. So let's, you know, wait until the autumn. So he was off for 113 days after that. And he returned at Down Royal uh, November and, you know, their big meeting to kick off the season. And he was up against Wood Who. Obviously, she's the filly of Gordon Elliott. Um, she'd won two races going into this. She, you know, she was fit, ready to go and on a winning sequence. And, you know, she was a much tougher opponent for him to come up against. And, you know, it gives a good level of form. Um, she was sent off the one to four favourite to, to oblige that day. And Cossack Jack gave her just a really good race the whole way around. Um, the two of them, you know, went pretty prominently. Cossack Jack just, you know, just in behind Woodhu. And, you know, they, they kind of got racing from about three furlongs out. And as I said, like, it, it, was, a, it was a good race all the way to the line. Unfortunately, Cossack Jack made a mistake at the second last where he kind of lost his landing gear and that unfortunately cost him the race in the end where he was beating a neck. Um, but he was giving three pounds to the winner who's rated 130 in Britain now and the pair pulled 18 lengths clear of the remainder as well. So I think that was a really good performance. Um, it set a high level of form for him. And yeah, he, he just he just looked like a, a juvenile going places that day. Um as such, as well, the form has been boosted as well because Wood Who's gone on to win a listed Phillies Juvenile. And as I said, it's rated 130 in Britain now, potentially could be running this weekend at Doncaster or Cheltenham. So um, there's plenty to like about him in, in that regard. And then, you know, that that kind of gave Cossack Track the, the right to go for the grade two juvenile hurdle at Lapis Town over Christmas. Um, he was a big price on the day. Obviously, it was, you know, it was a good field. Uh, and, you know, it's a contest that I rate quite highly in regards to the triumph, whether it is that type of standard, I guess we'll find out at the DRF, etc. But either way, I think it's going to be a very high standard for a race like the Boodles. Um, and yeah, as I said, unfortunately, again, you know, things didn't quite go his way because he was forced to make the running. He set off quite prominently. Um, no one really wanted to make the running. Obviously, as we've said many times, it's a very slowly run race. And I think it was kind of plan B that he ended up, you know, taking a lead and tried to make it somewhat of a test for Nurberg Ring, who obviously was the stable number one that day. Um, he only set a slow pace out in front. However, though, you know, as I said, that's been well documented. We've spoken about that on this podcast before. Um, and, you know, it's despite him being right up there turning for home, he was quickly passed by all the closers that were in behind, ready to rock and roll. And he, he ended up coming home for sixth place, beating seven and a half lengths by Carla Conti. But what is interesting is he, he finished within a really interesting group of horses. Um, he was only two lengths behind the current Boodle's favourite, Batman Jirak. 
Um, and he was also just behind Carafan, who's another horse who would have a chance in the Boodles. And he was just ahead of next time up min- winner, Miss Manzo, who obviously went and won the other day for William Mullins as well. So I think that form is going to look good. Um, and yeah, re- the reason why he's kind of come up as a bet this week is because he's been entered in the Triumph trial on Saturday, where he's been given a BHA mark of 129, which I think looks fair. Um, that compares to a mark of 133, which Batman Jerick was given the week before. So he'd be four pounds better off of him at the weights for a two length defeat. Um, and he'd also be four pounds better off of Wood, who obviously, as I said, was rated 130, but he was trying to give three pounds to that day. So he's, you know, got good form with good horses that are fancied in the market for this race. Yeah, he's been better off at the weights and he's been probably campaigned with this race more in mind. Um, He's by Churchill, who's the same sire, obviously, as Comfort Zone, who ran in the Triumph Trial and won it um, this weekend last year. Um, so Joseph O'Brien has, you know, previous with this type of horse. But he does look like a nice big juvenile, which, you know, as I, as I said earlier, it's similar to Jazzy Matty in the sense that, you know, Shelton, he should absolutely relish and be able to get up the hill, no problems at all. But I think he does look like a much more classier horse, and he's definitely got better form in the book going into the race. So... Um, in terms of future targets, he obviously, as I said, he's entered at Cheltenham on Saturday. I wouldn't expect him to turn up um, unless they are just going to give him a spinner on Cheltenham. As I said, I don't think that will happen. I think they'll probably either wait for the infamous Nace four-year-old hurdle, which is going to be run on the 10th of February this year, or you know, and which they obviously use for Band of Outlaws as well, just to teach him how to race. Um, or they're just even fresh now that they know his mark is 129. He hasn't been given an, a triumph hurdle entry, despite all of the rest of Ju- um, Joseph O'Brien's juveniles being given one. Um, and one final little positive is that Connor Stone Walsh rode him over Christmas as well. And, you know, if he rode him in the Boodles, he'd be able to claim five pounds off. So that could be, a, you know, a handy little route if they wanted to go and win the race at win the race at Nace, but still get some weight taken off to, you know, stay around the same type of mark, then they could perhaps do so. Um, he's priced up at 20 to one, as I said. I think that's a really good price. 16 to one is available if you want the no run, non-runner no bet. But as I said, because he's not entered in the triumph, I don't have as big of reservations. I think this has always been the plan. And I think he looks like a really good bet for the race. Well, there's no better man at picking Boodles winners than Jake Price. And it would, <laughs> been, it would have been really disappointing if this Antipost series hadn't featured one. Uh, so hopefully, yeah, he'll go very well. I, I like that reasoning a lot as well. And I'm sure, Dan, you did too. Yeah, it's been a, a relatively kind race. Uh, we've targeted it a lot down the years in our series. And we generally yeah. there or thereabouts. So it's been relatively kind. So... Yeah, I mean, I remember Jake mentioned this to me a few weeks ago. To be fair, like we were looking at the race. Obviously, I came out with Batman Jirak being my horse before. Unfortunately, his price disappeared before I could put him up here. But I didn't really pay much mind to to Cossack Chak. To be fair, before Jake mentioned it, but as you can clearly see, there's a lot to recommend him. So, yeah, a very interesting one to go to war with. Yeah, very much so. That pretty much brings us it to the end of uh, this week's show. Been a lot of fun. As always, uh, please do remember to like and subscribe and comment too with your, your best anti-post that we'd love to hear from you as always. And if you are at Cheltenham on Saturday, Dan and Jake are both going to be signing autographs, so make sure you go and say hello. <laughs> if you want whatever disease I've got as well, then you're more than willing to come get it. Yeah. <laughs> It'll definitely be still hanging around by then as well, given what's happened in the past yeah. Yeah. 10 days. Good stuff. All right, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again next time.